Welcome to this week's episode of the Baseball Together Podcast, where we have a free agent frenzy, a rundown, and we're going to recap MLB awards next. Nine Plus Us presents the Baseball Together Podcast with your hosts, Blackjack Brad and Kansas City Little Big Briggy Blue Eyes. And now, Baseball Together. Welcome back to another week's episode of the Baseball Together Podcast, Baseball Family. As always, I am Brad, and this week, Brig is out again. So I'm joined by actually somebody I was introduced to, thanks to Jason, who was our co-host a couple weeks ago. We have with us Jonathan Mullins. Welcome, Jonathan. Thank you for joining me. Hey, glad glad to be here. <laughs> Excellent. We're glad to have you. Well, we have a ton of stuff to go through. Like I said before, we have a free agent frenzy. Things just went crazy today. News was dropping all over the place this afternoon. Um, and this is coming in pretty tight with the CBA expiring here in a couple days. Um, I think a lot of these guys are trying to get get secured before that expires. So, Jonathan, are you ready to get into this? I am. All right, let's do it. Um, first, actually, before we do that, before we get into the free agent frenzy, let's talk Hall of Fame ballot. Oof. I got so excited and so all up into the free agency thing, I forgot about the Hall of Fame ballot. So... There are a couple notables, uh, notable additions this year. We have A Rod, and we also have Big Poppy, his bigness, David Ortiz on the ballot. Um, do you think think either of those guys are going to get in? I think if either guy is going to get in, it's going to be Poppy. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think A Rod's going to get on get in on his first go. I think. Poppy's your mm-hmm. best bet, but I still am not sure just because I don't know, man. The it's, Hall of Fame voting is just so it's ridiculous. It is ridiculous. Way. It's incredibly ridiculous. You're you're spot on with that. And I just I I'm curious about David Ortiz because of the whole uh that list that came out. I can't remember what it was called off the top of my head. Uh that he was on that said that he had tested positive for PEDs and he denied it. Deny, and I'm sure he'll continue to deny it till the day he dies. Um, but A Rod, I don't see him getting in. I know he, it seems like he's been really trying the last couple of years with, uh, with like this whole image rehab that he's done with broadcasting baseball games, dating J Lo, and being in the studio and stuff like that. Like all that seems like he's gotten gained favor in public eye. But like the dude tested positive twice. And was kind of the ringleader for a lot of those problems that caused, that were going on in Major League Baseball. I don't see him ever getting in, honestly. Well, you don't really, when you hear the heat behind that, behind the PED era, I don't really ever hear A-Rod's name cast at the top of the list. You know what I mean? Well, it's he's always Bonds because guy. he's a record holder, right? And Roger Clemens because he was Roger Clemens and that whole mess. I was thinking about this today, though, and because I'm a big Barry Bonds advocate. Barry Bonds, to me, is a Hall of Famer. He was a Hall of Famer before the juice. Yes, he was. He was a Hall of Famer before the juice. And and it just comes down to nobody wants to look past that because if you let Bonds in, you've got all that Clemens in, you've got all that everyone else in. Mm -hmm. Um, Personally, I think he's a Hall of Famer. I don't care if he ever does get in Hall of Fame. Just because I don't hold – well – Bonds, I don't care if he ever does, just because to me he's a Hall of Famer. He doesn't have to have that classification. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I get um, that. He well, and, like and Bonds said, and Clemens, was, this is their last year on the ballot too. If they don't get in, same thing with right. Sosa and Schilling. If they don't get in now, then it's got to be the guys who Brig and I refer to as the Culture Club deciding, right. you know, years down the road. But and it, like out of all those guys, I feel like and I I'm, I liked Sosa for what mm-hmm. he was in that time, but. Sammy Sosa without the juice is never more than an average baseball player. I don't believe and a corked bat. <laughs> so, like to me, if any of them shouldn't even really be there, it would be Sosa. Mm-hmm. Um, Schilling was pretty dominant. I feel like Schilling, Schilling deserves to be in. And if you don't want to vote a guy in because you think he's a jerk and you don't agree with his politics, like that's on you. You know. <laughs> They did vote Derek Jeter in almost unanimously. So it's true. <laughs> you're right. You're right. They did. And but... I'm so glad for that one writer. I wish I knew who he was because I'd like to shake his hand. <laughs> Love it. And, you know, Brig always gives me a hard time because I always say that A Rod wasn't the best shortstop on his team. The best shortstop on his team was playing third base when he was there. You know? So that's always been my argument. But he, 
And you know, I don't want to, I don't want to beat the Derek Jeter bush too much, but um, Derek Jeter was a, an, a, a great leader. Mm-hmm. Um, do I think he's the greatest ever at his position? No. I do feel I like Nomar was better at his position at the time too. Just he didn't have the longevity. He wasn't even the best in his generation at yeah. his position. So mm-hmm. the reason he was almost a unanimous Hall of Famer is because he was a Yankee. Like it has nothing to do with his actual talent on the field. No offense, if he paid play for the Mariners, he might not have made first ballot. No, probably not. I mean, and it took Edgar Martinez as long as it did to get in. He had the award named after him before he got into the Hall of Fame. You know, so no, <laughs> you're preaching to the choir on that one. I've been making that argument on this show for almost three years now. <laughs> but yeah, um, so so we got Schilling, Sosa, Clemens, and Bonds. It's their last year. Uh, first year this year for sure. Like we said, we have A Rod and David Ortiz. Plus we have Carl Crawford, Prince Fielder, Ryan Howard, Justin Morneau, Joe Nathan, Jake Peavy, AJ Przinsky, uh, Mark Teixeira. Jimmy Rollins and Tim Lincecum to me of that group is the most interesting just because he was so good, but such Lincecum a flash was in the pan. So dominant. Another guy there that I've really liked. It's just, I think injuries is what will kind of haunt the thought mm-hmm. of him making it as Prince Fielder was so good. He was, uh, it's, mm-hmm. it was kind of sad when he had to give up on the game just because mm-hmm. he was on that trajectory to, I believe, be a Hall of Famer. Yeah, uh, I agree with you. Big time, Tim. I mean, at his peak, was there anybody more dominant? I mean, he won, what, three Cy Young Awards? I mean... Two World he, Series? Yeah, two World Series. Uh, I, I want to double check on that, uh, on those uh, Cy Youngs, because I, I want to say it was at least three. And if it was only three, it was three in four years, I believe. Yeah. Yes. Oh, so so he won two. He won back to back his second year in the league and his third year in the league, and then he was top ten the next two years after that. And uh, he kind of had what's listed on Baseball Reference as a ten year career, but really it was only like eight because of injuries. Right. You know, but I mean, full four time All Star. The guy, the guy had such a small peak that it, it really makes it hard to argue for him. But on the other hand, he was so good for those four years. <clears throat> Sandy Koufax is in. Valid. So I mean, I can't think of like that time in baseball. How good Tim was, and then that just that Giants team was so good, and yeah. I don't believe they're kind of given their due. A lot of the time, they're kind of mm-hmm. a team that's overlooked throughout the last 20 years. Yeah. But, man, Tim at his peak and then bring in the wild man to close it out. Oh, yeah. those were fun times. They were. That was, that was a good team, a lot of fun to watch. All right, now let's go ahead and get on to the free agency. I got to, like I said, I got a little bit ahead of myself before because I'm so excited about this. I love free agency so much. I geek out big time. I'm checking my phone all day long. Let's start with the Rangers. We're going to start in the AL West today, um, which doesn't happen often, but it's going to because the Rangers have signed Marcus Simeon, Corey Seager, and John Gray to a total of $556 million guaranteed. Simeon has seven years, 175. Seager got 10 years, 325, got a bag. And then uh, John Gray got four years, 56 million. And I'm curious if maybe the Rangers GM thought that he was getting Sonny Gray and not John Gray. (laughs) <laughs> because uh, I think <laughs> that's a lot of money. <laughs> I don't think Simeon was totally, totally over the top money wise. Simeon, I feel like so, is like uh, right there. That's what I'd have given him. I feel like he got paid properly. Mm-hmm. Um, John Gray, Sonny Gray. I, I'm not real sure. Seems like a lot of money. Well, and this is the thing with John Gray is a guy coming out of. Colorado playing for the Rockies and still being desirable to anybody. Mm-hmm. I feel like it says something about him, right? That's that's true. That is so, true. I do I do still feel like he's probably overpaid. Seeger? That's, <laughs> that's a lot, a of, money lot of money. For Dang. a dude. So Seeger, my my big pause with him is like a lot of Mariners fans are like, oh, we got to keep Kyle Seeger and bring in Corey Seeger to play next to him or play second base. I'm like, that dude had Tommy John surgery. And I know he's not a pitcher, 
but a fielder with who plays like he does, I would be very, very leery of a guy coming off of Tommy John surgery, especially at only 27 years old. I was getting ready to say he I couldn't remember if he was creeping on 30. So 27, 10, he's 37 by the time that contract's up. Yeah. But the 10 years um, makes sense to me. Like that's not outrageous because he's not going to be over the hill. Like he'll be out of his prime by then because his prime he'll probably be out of the out of his prime by the time he's 32, 33. But at the same time, it makes sense for them to show some loyalty with 10 years to get a guy to 37. It's the money, I think, that because like you're to me, you're paying him. I'd have to look back and we'll get on him later. But Bryce Harper's deal was 12 years. It was over 300. It yeah, I think he was 12 years, 350. Yeah. Is what so he you're was. telling me that Corey Seager is in it's the same more. ballpark. That's uh, more per more. year. Yeah. I'm not a Bryce Harper advocate, but I just don't see that. I think it's a slight <laughs> overpay. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, especially he didn't play a didn't even play a hundred games this year. Um, looks like I believe he had Tommy John in 2018 because he played 26 games there. He played 134 games in 2019 coming back from TJ. But still, I mean, he does hit a hair below 300. And um part of that is the year coming back after Tommy John, he hit 272. Um, I feel like he's a good fielder, and he he definitely came in through in the clutch for the for the Dodgers. He does that in the postseason every year, right. and he was the World Series MVP. So you might have to overpay for him, but not that much. I don't feel like you got to overpay that. I'm much. I'm just trying to think who is in the Rangers rotation right now. That's that, their issue. They don't have any pitching, and they don't have any money to get pitching. Like man. I was talking to my buddy, my buddy Jewel, who's actually going to be on in a couple weeks. Um, I was like, that's a whole lot of money for the Rangers to finish fourth because the only reason I think they're going to finish fourth is because the A's are having a fire sale and they're going to finish fifth. Like, they still don't have any pitching. They can't pay any. They can't pay anybody to get any pitching there. And we've seen in the last couple of years with the Padres and the Angels continue to pay guys and continue to lose. You've got well, that pitching. Jack, I always mess his name up. Jack Lytle. Is that how you say it? The Vanderbilt pitcher. Oh, um, Jack Leiter? Leiter. He's got a lot of potential, but he's still a long way from it. Mm -hmm. So it's like that's probably your next potential ace, Mm -hmm. but that's still only one guy. Yeah. I think it's really hard to win today without – I mean, really you need three dogs on, on the mound. In, mm-hmm. in a seven-game series, you need three legit starters. And to- three good relievers. Right. One of them being a closer. Yeah. Um, and they don't have it. They don't have it in Texas. They're going to have to make some moves. And the nice thing for them is that, like, like John Gray, good piece right now for that for that pitching staff. But he's only there for four years. Mm-hmm. Seager's there for 10. Simeon's there for seven. You know, you're going to, you might see them start to contend towards the middle of Simeon's contract, but at the same time, is he going to get disgruntled and want out if they continue to lose? Right. I don't know. I don't know. It's going to be, it's going to be interesting. And then another team that spent a bunch of money over the last week, and especially today, Monday, the 29th of November, was the New York Mets. Uh, they got Sterling Marte, Mark Canna, Eduardo, um, Escobar and uh, Max Scherzer today, three years, $130 million. Talking about getting a bag. Wow. 37 years old. And he has an opt out after two years. (laughs) I didn't even read that he had an opt out yet. (laughs) So (laughs) if he is disgruntled with playing for the Mets at the age of 40, he can go play somewhere else and chase a ring. You know, um, I've always been a big fan of Sterling Marte, and it, it really just goes back to that was the first baseball player I ever seen in person at the minor league level. That looked like truly, a freak. Yeah, like he was just so much better than everybody else on the field. This was in yeah. single A ball in West Virginia, and you could just see that he was the best guy on the field. So I've always had kind of a, so- a soft spot for Marte. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's a terrible signing. I just – I don't get given Scherzer – that much money. Um, well, and especially since in the NLCS, he said that his arm was dead. 
and I and granted he's been pitching all season after a season after a shortened season last year in 2020, and coming in pitching this full year and then pitching on short rest in in the NL in the NLCS like. That's still not a good sign for a guy who's 37 to be no. saying that his arm's dead when you need him the most. And so. I really kind of – I thought he was going to come back to Washington. I'm not going to lie. I really did. did I'm you? glad that yeah. he didn't because if we would have had to give him that. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. That, and that's not. what that's the same thing. I was talking with Jewel about that. Like, man, we need to – like Scherzer would be awesome in Seattle. Like a mentor, lead this team to the playoffs and, you know, just like, cement that legacy you know and then when we saw 130 mil like no you can have him in new york we don't need him and the thing is he's gonna they're gonna pay him 130 million dollars for them still to finish third in the division exactly because they're gonna continue to met the bed yeah they can't i mean atlanta is only going to get better yeah as much as i hate to admit that atlanta like you just won a world series without ronald acuna your Mm -hmm. bet i mean your best player um, well, and who was their pitcher that was out this year with um, – oh. kind of th- they, they had a pitcher out this year because of uh, an Achilles, and he's going to come back. That rotation's just going to be really, really good, and it's mm-hmm. just like how how do you give a guy that's 37 years old $130 million, and then you're, you're literally going to finish third because I think Philly is probably going to finish second. Mm-hmm. So, I the Phillies weird. I mean, I say this every week. I feel like Phillies weird. I feel like they underachieve every single year. I don't. I don't know why. I don't know what it is. I do expect them to finish second, but I wouldn't at the same time be be surprised if they finished third. If they finished third above the Mets, Philly. The Phillies are that team to me that I'll just go and say they're never going to win a World Series with Bryce Harper. Because this this leader that Bryce Harper has became, I, I think it's kind of a, a mask in a sense. The, the next time that adversity hits, we're going to see really how much of a leader Bryce Harper is. I do he, feel like I he's matured in Philly, though. I'll give him that. Like, I, I, I really feel like he has. Because when, um, when Andrew McCutcheon got injured, he was the one who stepped up and – and was the example, you know, he might not necessarily be the guy on the field. Like he, he's kind of like the, the, um, the Hayward from the 2016 world series, you know, like he was over pretty much in that series, but still he stands up and he rallies the troops going into the, going into extra innings after a rain delay in game seven of the world series. And they go on and win because of what he said, you know, Harper, everybody's getting on his case for going over the end of the, the season when they needed those games to get into the playoffs, getting swept by the Braves. But at the same time, he has done things to that team to help them continue to move. And I think that it's going to get better. That I think he was kind of feeling himself in that role this year and seeing that I can play this role. Because if you think about it, like he's always been the young prima donna in the clubhouse. He came in really, really young into the big leagues, like really young. There was no reason for him to have been the voice, in the, like the voice of leadership in that clubhouse. It was the voice of reason. Even when he played Juco, baseball he was like 17 years old with a ged those guys were all 20 21 years old why were they going to listen to this kid coming in who was the prima donna who was going to go play major league baseball in three years how many games did mccutcheon play before he went down um i'm not sure let me see if i can find it real quick though um mccutcheon was in when i saw him come to arizona in july i think it was he played a total of so this year he played a, a total of 144 games. It was 2019. He he played 59 was all. So McCutcheon played 120 games this year, roughly. 144 this year. 144. So yeah. But a lot of people kind of look at it as Harper stepped up this year into that role. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I I just don't buy it with Harper. I have to see. I have to see more of it. I, mm-hmm. I still don't think they're going to win with him. I just don't think and he's a winner. And that's one of the things too is when they when when they traded or when they had him sign that deal. I told my buddy, I was like, they have to win a World Series in four or five years, or they they got to trade him. They have to because he's not going to be the answer if he hasn't if they haven't won one by then. Right. So I, I I think I see him getting traded to an American League team here in the next. Well, I guess not because we're going to have the 
DH in the National League here pretty soon, most likely. So I do think he'll be traded probably in two years, though. Maybe the deadline. Where, where do you think he'll go, though? Somebody who needs a DH. I'd bring him in as a DH. He's a he's a subpar fielder. Like he's serviceable, but you can get somebody else out there who's better. So, um, uh, but I don't know. I think it would just depend on who's contending at the point at that at that time, you know. So, but uh, but no. Back to what you're saying about Starling Marte, though. Like I think he's a really good piece. I like him a lot. Um, I was telling one of my buddies, I was like, you know, I like Starling Marte, uh, but to me. He's not a guy to build around. He's like he's more of a candlestick than a centerpiece. Mm. He's a really good complementary piece, but you're not going to win a World Series if he's your best hitter. No. And he's they saw not, that in Oakland. I agree series. with that 100. He's not. So. He's not a superstar. He's that guy that fits there and just kind of yeah. he just produces silently. Yeah. And that's the thing is that's that's what he does. Is he produces. He does what you need him to do, but he's not going to do anything beyond that. He's not going to go above and beyond it. But uh, let's talk Astros for just a minute. Um, they re-signed Justin Verlander for one year. Um, honestly, that's kind of where he belongs. I mean, he's he's 38 years old, coming off of Tommy John. And he missed, like, it was weird to me because he missed, like, almost that entire shortened season. Brig and I kept saying, he's going to need Tommy John. It sounds like he needs Tommy John. And finally, like, September, middle of September, Verlander needs Tommy John. Like, we've been telling you, just get it done, man. Right. <laughs> you know? And so he missed this entire year, and now he's coming back as uh, he's going to be 39 when the season starts. And they said that he was throwing 95 at that workout for all those scouts, but I mean that might have been kilometers, if you're asking me. <laughs> he, I mean, Verlander's he's he's one of the greats in my opinion. He is. He's going to be a first ballot Hall of Famer for sure. Um. Now, I mean, really, he's just kind of securing some money at this point. Um, Houston, I mean, I think they kind of proved that this year Houston's going to compete. They're going to continue to compete. They know how to develop players for sure. Yeah. That's 100%. Um, yeah, I don't think he's necessarily going to anchor that staff anymore, but he's going to be a solid veteran presence for the guys coming up and a voice of leadership in the clubhouse that they're going to need. Um they're going to be without Correa. Um, Alex Bregman cannot seem to stay healthy. And Jose Altuve seems to struggle in the postseason these days. Mm. Forgets how to throw the ball to first base somehow. I don't know. I'm not sure how that works. <laughs> but, but no, Verlander, I feel like, is going to be going to need to be there if they're going to continue to, to contend because they could have some major issues without a voice or reason in that clubhouse. I can't, I can't throw their names out off the top of my head, but I know they've got the two legit starters – um, there, there's a third guy in there that I'm, I'm kind of, I'm missing. Oh man, why can't I think? I know who you're talking about. They have that starter, that rookie Vasquez, Vasquez. who's just a beast. So there, you're he's a problem. At, if you, if you have three, like I said, three legit starters, and you have a bullpen game or a bullpen game in game four of any series, um, you you've legit got a chance to win. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's Framber Valdez is who I was thinking of, and then um, Luis Garcia. Yeah. So then even if Verlander's your third guy in that rotation, if he can come out and give you four solid innings, mm -hmm. and then four, you hope more for five, six. But if he can do that, then you – I mean, they can still win with what they got. Oh, definitely. I mean, I've been saying it for a long time. Kyle Tucker, to me, is – one of the yeah. most underrated players in Major League Baseball right now. He is actually number two for the Astros this year in war with 5.7 behind Correa. Like, that guy. I remember him coming up the first time I saw him come up to uh, up to the plate. I think it was in the World Series a couple years ago. I was like, who's this guy? And then he goes and doubles off the wall. Hits like a rope. I'm like, who's this guy? Shoot. <laughs> That's what I, him. <laughs> I got a buddy that calls him the accountant because he looks like he should probably be working on Wall Street, but he's that's just exactly what I said. He looks like an accountant. One hundred percent. No, they. I mean, the Astros, like you said, they develop talent well. Um, mm. They're going to continue to be good. It's yep. kind of. It, it's not that people are chasing them down, but in a way, they kind of are. 
Um, the Yankees, the Yankees are the Yankees. They they can't get over the hump. Um, well, they can't get out of their own way either. Yeah. They haven't done anything. I, I saw this morning that there was talks about them possibly uh, dealing Gary Sanchez, but they can't seem to get the value they want out of him because there's no value, and they think yeah, there is value. I mean, honestly, and this is what has been talked about with the Nats a little bit, like I'm going to take a flower on Clint Frazier right now before I'm going to take on like Gary Sanchez. It's just yeah. not. I mean, yeah. yeah different positions, but like there's no value to me in Gary Sanchez. Really, when you look at the Yankees roster across the board, there's a lot of big names and a whole lot of money, but there's no guy on there that I'm going to try and sell my farm to get. Right. Uh, Not even Judge these days, especially not Stanton. Judge, Stanton, no. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, probably the next best thing they got coming up is Dominguez. But he's still got a long way to go. He's just, mm-hmm. I mean, he, is he 18 yet? He might be 18 now. I don't know. I'm not sure. But he, I mean, he looks like he's going to be a stud. But, but that's he's one. A long way. <laughs> and he's that's a long he way. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Speaking of Frazier, I got a different Frazier for you. The Mariners traded for Adam Frazier from the Padres. I could not have been more excited about this. Jerry DePoto got his guy. He tried to make a deal for him at the trade deadline with the Pirates, and he got the uh, the the Padres came in their last second and scooped him under out from underneath him. Um, he was an All Star this year. He struggled in San Diego, but everybody else did too. Right. So I don't have a problem with that, you know. Especially yeah. in that second half of that season, there was a dumpster fire down there. So I don't. I'm not going to hold anything against him as far as how things went in the second half of the season. But he fills a hole for sure because the Mariners specifically said going to the offseason we want a full time second baseman. Right. Abraham Toro filled that hole this year uh, after the trade deadline, and he did it outstanding. But he is more of a third baseman. Um, he's built like a third baseman. He's, he's got the speed or lack thereof of third base. He's definitely got the glove and the arm, so I'm happy about that. Um, but Frazier is going to be an awesome filling in that hole at second base. you talking that about a guy said, that's kind of like he's went from he's went from really two bad situations, and now he's going to be in Seattle with a fresh start. I mean, with Pittsburgh, we know, we know how Pittsburgh is. Yeah. Unfortunately, you know, mm-hmm. I'm not big on – Pittsburgh fans, whatever, but you know, they, they deserve better. <laughs> they do. Uh, and that's that's the problem is that most fan bases do deserve better than what they have. And I never thought of anybody hear anybody saying he's going to Seattle referring to it being a better situation than either Pittsburgh or San Diego. Well, I really and I mean, really, that. with San Diego <laughs> is, um, I think Tatis and Machado are both really, I mean, they're, they're superstars. In a mm-hmm. sense, but there, there just seems like there's something's going to go down there if they don't get it straightened out. And it's there's so much talent in San Diego, but I wouldn't want to play in San Diego right now. No, I wouldn't want to. And, you know, I talked about this a while ago. I can't remember if it was here or in Jason's podcast, but I was talking about how I feel like a lot of what went down, especially with Tatis towards the end of the season, was frustration trying to learn a new position in the middle of the season. Center field is a hard place to play, and you're playing at the big league level. I can't imagine how hard that is, especially going from the infield. Like you can go from one of the corner outfields to center field and be mostly comfortable, but going from shortstop to center field, that's those aren't even in the same that, time zone. And the the thing is too, though, I mean, we have to give him his due. Like to be able to do that. Mm-hmm. Is I mean that just tells you what kind of athlete he is. Yeah, yeah, and that is the thing is that they had the trust in him because he is a tremendous athlete. I mean, Absolutely. to me, Tatis is a probably a top five player under. I mean, under twenty five, he's for sure top mm-hmm. five. Yeah, he's for sure. Gonna, if he's not the best player in baseball in the next five years, he's going to be the top three. Uh, I can see that. He. I just hope that it doesn't fall apart in San Diego. I'd like to see him do well. Everybody, I'd like to see that team do well, um, especially with the reign of terror that the Dodgers have had on the NL West. And, um, you know, the, the Giants coming out of nowhere was refreshing, but at the same time, I don't think it's going to hold. I don't think that, that's gonna, that they're going to stick around up there. I think this was kind of a one-year wonder for them. 
Um, but real quick with the Mariners, made another deal today. Robbie Ray, five years, $155 million. Looking at the Scherzer deal and how much the Rangers paid for, for Seager, I'm like, that's a steal. That's such a good oh, deal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Especially for the reigning Cy Young Award winner. Holy right. smokes. That's, and, I mean, I mean, that's the getting, piece that we need. You're getting two more years than what you're getting with what you would have got with Scherzer. Because we both said you'd love to see Scherzer in yeah. um, Seattle, yeah. but not for that type of money. You're getting a guy for two more years. Mm-hmm. Like you said, reigning Cy Young. It's, I mean, it's a good deal. Yeah, I think it's a great deal. And the other guy that the Mariners have talked about is uh, getting Chris Bryant. And I'll say it again. I feel like the Giants saying they don't feel like he, they feel like he is, his glove is subpar and his swing isn't going to age well is like the guy who breaks up with the girl and says, yeah, dude, she's a six. Like, no, she's a solid nine at yeah. least. You know, that's what that feels like to are, me. Are they, trying to, are they trying to lower his value? I Maybe mean, <laughs> take him off the market. Come on back. We'll give you them. We'll give you some money. It might not be what you wanted, but we'll give it to you. Chris Bryant's a guy that I look at. Um, I think he could be a, a legit leader in the clubhouse for mm-hmm. a team that wants him. Yeah. I don't feel like that Chicago really wanted him towards the end of his tenure there. And yeah. I mean, they were selling the farm anyway. In a right. Lot of ways. Exactly. And yeah. for the Giants to talk like that, like, Oh, I wouldn't go back there at all. No. I, wouldn't be, I mean, wouldn't be looking. Well, I'm going near back there. I'm going back there in a different uniform to smash home runs into the bay. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I would love to have Chris Bryant at third base. Um, I did fall in love with Abraham Toro this season, but Chris Bryant is an upgrade, and I'll take it for sure. And a guy you got coming up shortly, um, Julio Rodriguez. Rodriguez, dude. President of the J Rod fan club, right here. He's looked pretty awesome. What I've seen him so far this year, mm-hmm. um, or should I say last year? Yeah, no, uh, yeah, mm-hmm. I know. What you mean he's he's legit, man. He is going to be really good. I don't know if he's going to uh, come up this year. He hasn't played above Double A yet, mm-hmm. um, so I'm sure he won't be on the opening day roster. But that outfield is really crowded, especially if you got Frazier, Bryant. And Toro trying to fill second base and third base and then outfield positions. Um, it's a really crowded outfield, so it might be later on in the year before we see him. But they have said that he's not on the trade block; like he is off limits. Nobody's yeah. nobody's trading for him. Yeah, he Even should. They could get a haul for him. Considered. Yeah, exactly. Um, let's do one more here before we go into our break. Um, let's go with the Royals' new uniforms. Did you see these? I did. The Royals, uh, the Royals got no uniforms. What are what are some of your initial thoughts on this? I like that they stayed pretty classic. Mm-hmm. Um, just slight changes, but I think it was an upgrade mm-hmm. in a lot of ways. I prefer for teams to stick more traditional. If you want to, if you want to have a wild uniform, like I'm a big fan of the turn back or turn. What is it? Turn turn forward, ahead the clock. Turn ahead the mm-hmm. clock. The Mariners that they the were red and black. Today. Yeah. Those were sweet. Um, it's cool to have one, but I, I prefer for teams to keep that traditional vibe. And I think Kansas City done a good job, and they gave it a modern feel. Um, I like it. I like it a lot. It's nice and crisp and clean. Um, they kind of pulled back some of that, uh, like the font on Kansas City on the road uniform looks a lot like the uh, the Negro League font mm-hmm. that was originally used for the uh, for the Monarchs. Um, I like that. I don't know if they did that intentionally, but that's what that that's the first thing I thought of when I saw that. Mm-hmm. Um, that's nice and crisp. I was trying uh, to figure out where I'd seen that font at. Like I said, I don't know if it's if it's the exact same thing, but that's what it looks like to me. That's that's what I thought of when I saw it. Um, but it for some reason, the, like the home, the home white, and the the baby blue, they just look cleaner. I don't know what it is about it. Like I don't know if they took a crown off of there or something, but just that that royal script with the underline and the number looks really clean. The way that they did that with just the blue or the white, depending on the jersey. I gotta pull them back up here. Um, probably but, my favorite is probably the the gray. Mm-hmm. I think it looks really classy, and I do like the uh, I don't know what you call it, powder blue, baby blue. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious to see what type of helmets they wear with those. I'm, I love uniforms, but it's like I'm a, 
an odd mix of I want my traditional uniform mm -hmm. and throw me something wild out there. Like, no, I understand that. Yeah, for sure. Um, I love the royal blue with mm -hmm. the Kansas City on it. I am a sucker for alternate uh, alternate jerseys, like the color jerseys. I love it. Um, that baby blue looks great. But that being said, like I said, that white Royals jersey is clean. That is crisp. You can never go wrong with white. Mm -hmm. I mean, yep. you know, because you live in that area, I, I don't understand why Arizona ever went away from the, uh, the purple. I love yeah, – they, they were so classy, and they've changed their uniforms like 15 times. Oh, like three times in the last four years. They're always terrible. Them up. They've had some bad ones. They have, but that purple is really popular around here. Like, uh, I was coaching my son's fall ball team, and, um, and we all got to choose the colors of our teams. Mm -hmm. And there were four teams this fall in our league, and mm -hmm. three of them wanted to incorporate purple to their, to their color scheme. <laughs> Like so the, it's really popular. The I, I was a big fan of the what was it the black jersey with the diamond backs written out across. Oh, yeah, it. yeah. I think well, they had D backs. I, right now, I know they have D backs. I don't remember the mm -hmm. diamond backs across it, but yeah. No, I know what you're talking about though. To me though, what they have now with the black and the Sedona, like the way they use it, tr like typically, is really good. The, that color combination is really sharp. But I'm also a trail a Trailblazers fan, so if it's black and red, I'm probably gonna like it. So. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> anyway, let's go ahead and take a quick break. When we get back, Jonathan's going to get a rundown. No matter which ballpark you're at, you want to rep your team. Now you can with 9 Plus Us. Welcome to the Big City Series. With every design available in your team's colors, you can fit in with the home crowd or stand out on the road. Either way, we have the colors you crave. Shop the Big City Series and find designs that rep your favorite baseball podcast, cheer from the cheap seats, and much more. Drop the Big City Series only at 9plusus.com. Welcome back, baseball family. Uh, so like I said, Jonathan, this is his first time on the podcast. I mean, we're going to do to him the same thing we do to all of our guests the first time they come on. He's going to get a rundown. Are you ready for this, Jonathan? I'm ready. Okay. As we say, these are um, mostly baseball-related questions. Some of them are not at all. And uh, here we go. Let's see how you think on your feet. First question, what is your quest? My quest? Oh. In life, retirement. That is my mm. quest. Finding my way quest. to retirement as soon as possible. That's a good quest. My dad taught me that 30 years ago, I think. Work your way to retirement. <laughs> He's still not there. <laughs> um next question what is your favorite color oh favorite color i'm a big green fan big green uh, like the hat yeah about green about fan. this color green yeah it goes nice. good with the red i like it is there a maximum allowable age that is appropriate to bring a baseball glove to a professional baseball game I believe 18 to 80 does not matter. You can take a baseball glove with you to any game. For one, the older you get, the slower your reaction time gets. The glove helps. <laughs> the thing that's funny about that is we, we ask a lot of people that question, and everybody always says, there is no maximum age. It doesn't matter. Bring it. Got to protect yourself, right? And for some reason, there's this whole – machismo thing no you don't bring a baseball glove to the game they're not going to call you out of the stands to play just catch with your bare hands like no i use my hands to work <laughs> times I've, I've had balls that are coming in to the seats and i'm like i can totally snag this but if i break my hand mm -hmm. i'm not going to be able to work exactly exactly right and i think it was like the second episode that we ever recorded i was like think about this you're out in the outfield the ball is 105 off the bat you think you're going to be able to catch that by the time it reaches the stands? Mm. Mm. Simple physics tells you that ball's coming in at about 100 miles an hour, and you're not going to catch that barehanded. I'm sorry. I don't care who you are. But good answer. I like it. Next question. What is the name of your autobiography? Oh, the name of my autobiography. E. <laughs> 
the name of my autobiography would be what I should have done the first time around. Nice. I like it. A little bit of revisionist history in there. Nope. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Creative. I like that a lot. That's good. All right. If your favorite team, the Washington Nationals, correct? That's right. Was a beverage, what would they be? Ooh. What's your favorite beer? Oh, I don't drink beer. You don't drink beer? No. Hmm. <laughs> Sorry. What's your, what's your favorite drink? I have a Diet Mountain Dew right here with me. It would be a Diet Mountain Dew. A Diet Mountain Dew. <laughs> That's what they would be. They're your favorite drink? <laughs> they are. There you go. That's good. I like it. Besides original, what is the best sunflower seed flavor? I'm a big barbecue fan. Have you ever had barbecue and pepper together? I believe so. That's another sleeper, though. The, just the pepper. Mm -hmm. The pepper sunflower seeds. Oh, those are good, too. So the combo is next level. Because if you like steak, mm -hmm. that's what you get. It's a steak flavor with, with the barbecue and the pepper. Yeah, that's it's good. it's it's a good way to go. It, what brand? What brand of barbecue do you prefer? Oh, uh, what is it? David's. David's. I'm a David's guy. Yeah. The uh, okay. what is the what's the other big brand? I cannot. Well, think. there's there's Bigs, Spitz, or Trash. Um, I think there's... Bigs reaches too far sometimes with their flavors, so I, that's yeah. why I really stick with David's most of the time. David's really simple. They have their hot jalapeno, which is outstanding. Which is that's my other favorite one, but I'm all about David Original. That's like, like I have right here. I have a, a seed sack. That's what mm. I have in here all day. I just <laughs> chop on sunflower seeds all day long. All right, next question: If the Brooklyn Dodgers or if the Dodgers never left Brooklyn, how different would baseball look today? It, it's kind of it's really tough to say. I, I think. They would probably be. They would probably be the Yankees, in a lot of ways, um, because a lot be. of the time, I believe they would probably have been very successful over the years. Um, yeah, I think a lot of people would look at them like the Yankees. They probably have a lot of championships, and a lot of people would hate them, but they would be successful. Yeah, I think you're right. You're right. All right, last question for you. If baseball was an ice cream flavor, what would it be? Oh, I'm a big strawberry fan. Like Daryl Strawberry? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> That's solid. I like strawberry. A lot of what we get on that is vanilla. There's nothing wrong with vanilla, but it's vanilla. Like, yes. okay. We got three, we got three in one day that one time. That was crazy. Really? Oh, man. Yeah. I didn't yeah. know that many people like vanilla ice cream. I like it, but I'm also kind of bland like that. But whatever. It's just me. But anyway, all right, let's take one more break. When we get back, we're going to talk about Major League Baseball awards. Take me out to the ball game. Take me out to the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and Cracker Jacks. I don't care if I never get back with me, root, root, root for the home to stay. Don't win, it's a shame, for it's one, two, three strikes, you're out at the old ball game. Shop kids' baseball strips at 9plusss.com. The Not Another Sports Podcast is the home of sports talk for everyone. Every other week, you can catch David and Jason as they talk about all things sports, from current events to classic moments and everything in between. You can find the Not Another Sports Podcast on Anchor.fm, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Podcast Addict, and more. Please don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. Welcome back, baseball family, to our final segment of the week. So 
since I didn't record anything last week, I just ran the uh, Andrew LaRose interview. I missed talking about the uh, MLB awards. So here we are today. We thought we'd go through them. Um, Jonathan and I actually have similar opinions about this, about the problem with it. So Jonathan, why don't you go ahead and lead us off with what is wrong with the award system? Personally, I believe the award system is flawed by writers voting on the awards. Mm -hmm. Uh, I find that same issue with, I honestly find the same issue with the Hall of Fame ballot Mm -hmm. as well to kick back onto that. Um, Just to throw a couple names out there to get it out of the way. Shoeless Joe Jackson is a Hall of Famer. Uh Pete Rose is a Hall of Famer. Mm. Barry Bonds is a Hall of Famer. (laughs) Roger Clemens is a Hall of Famer. And Kurt Schilling is a Hall of Famer. But I'm just one of those people that believes that your peers are the one that should judge you. Uh If you're going to be judged individually, which I'm not big on individual awards in anything. Um, Especially on a team game like baseball. Exactly. It's there's so much put into them that it, I don't know. I just don't hold them in high regard. Like if you Mm -hmm. tell me a guy won a world series championship or a guy won two MVPs, I don't care. That guy won two MVPs. Oh, well, he doesn't have a ring. Mm -hmm. Uh, And at the end of the day, flags fly forever. So you're right. It, the awards. Yeah. It's great for guys. Um, on the financial side, I mean, you had that conversation a little bit financially. It's yeah. very, very beneficial. And that's, then that's where my problem comes in is that you have writers who are going to hold grudges who yeah. get voters fatigue, um, who get real hot and bothered by a certain story throughout the year. Going to give a guy an award. Um, that it's not, it's not objective and there are financial repercussions that be, that come because of it i have the same problem with all-star voting i don't i refuse to vote for the all-star game because guys get financial incentives for making the all-star game and i don't want to have to, i don't want to be the one in the, and i understand it's one vote a day for what a month two weeks something like that but still like i don't want to have anything any part of that i don't want to be the still one how many guys, guys get robbed of that that all-star mm-hmm. vote because you've got it, it's opinion that, that's yep. what it comes down well, to. And, and they're not in a market that gets the exposure. They don't get the they don't get the national exposure, so they're not going to get the votes. Like like J.P. Crawford had an outstanding first half of the season. He should have probably been included on the All Star team somewhere, but because you have name recognition, granted Carlos Correa had an outstanding year, but you've got him and you've got other deep shortstops in the American League, especially who are going to make it ahead of J.P. Crawford, who, like I said, legitimately probably should have been on the team. Because right. he was great, great in the first half. So and, that is the problem that I have with All Star Games awards, things like that. Well, and I, I kind of look at it in this sense too, and I'm going to sound like I'm contradicting myself later on in this segment. Um, before the All Star break, you could argue that Juan Soto may have not been an All Star because he started so slow. Okay. And really, I believe he turned it on at the All Star break, the home run derby broke something loose in him to where uh-huh. I, I don't know. He just started to turn it up after that. But if I'm, I'd have to look back, but I'm pretty sure he was named an all-star. He wasn't mm-hmm. an alternate. Right. But you had a guy like Schwarber who was tearing the cover off the ball the first half. And I'm pretty sure he made it as an alternate. But he also, he did. I think he actually missed the all-star game because of an injury. He got hurt yeah. like right before. Right. So, but he wasn't even like, if you remember, what was it? The month of, uh, it was June. June. An amazing I mean, June. He was tearing the cover off the ball. Yeah. And he wasn't an all star, but Soto was. Uh-huh. It's just, and same yeah, team at the time, Soto's, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and that, that to me is just an, a small example of how many guys you see get shafted. Yeah. Just because their name's not the biggest one out there. They, mm-hmm. they may be the best player at their position, but, if they're not in the biggest market, yeah, what's the matter? Yep. Unless it's like the the Royals a few years ago. What was it like ten years ago when they basically stuffed the ballots? They had some kind of incentive for their fans to go out and vote, and they had I think that there were eight Royals starting in the All Star game, <laughs> seven or eight Royals. <laughs> it's unreal. 
And that Unreal. that's exactly why you should, the All Star Game should be voted on by their peers. Exactly. Who who is the best at your position? That that's it. Yep, I agree with you. All right, let's go ahead and get into these. So first, we have comeback player of the year um, in the American League. We had Joseph Anthony, also known as Trey Mancini. Um, he deserves comeback player of the year award the rest of his life, if you ask me. Coming Agreed. back from cancer the way he did, like that's hands down. There were some Mariners fans who wanted um, Mitch Haniger to win it mm-hmm. because he came back from a ruptured testicle and then a back injury mm-hmm. and, and had the year he did. I was like, I love me some Haniger, but he didn't come back from stage three cancer. <laughs> so I'm sorry. Uh, so Trey Mancini gets it the rest of his life. Mancini's one of those guys that, like we were just discussing, if he played in another market, Mancini's name would be huge. He would be. I 100% agree with you, though. He should be comeback player of the year for the next 10 years. Yep. Um, in the National League, we had Buster Posey. Um, again, I love me some Buster Posey. I can't think of anybody who is actually more deserving than Posey, just off the top of my head. Um, he, he took 2020 off because his wife had just had – I think they had just adopted twins or something like that, triplets. They just had, they just had babies more, and, like, multiples, not just had- a single baby. I can't remember if they had twins or if they adopted twins. Yeah, yeah, same thing. But either way, they had two new babies in the house. I don't blame him at the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic being like, no, I'm not going to go play baseball. I got more important things to worry about right now. And he he had the money to sit out. But he came back and had an outstanding year and led the Giants to the best record in baseball. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think with either guy, there was really no argument there. Mm -hmm. Um, Trey Manzini. Not even a question in my book. Buster Posey, I can't think of anybody that's more deserving. Mm -hmm. So, to me, I feel like the the writers nailed that one. They definitely did. Okay, let's go on down to manager of the year. Before we get into the one that we want to talk about, let's go down to the National League first and talk. Gabe Kapler uh, was the National League manager of the year. Um, Deserves it. Nobody saw the Giants coming from anywhere and they go on and they win uh 107 games like, if i'm not mistaken where was kapler at before he was in san francisco he was in philly hmm. i thought so i just wanted to yeah. I, I wanted to make sure my memory was correct there <laughs> your memory does serve you yeah, <laughs> and it uh, didn't end well it didn't go well at all yeah. for him by the way it's philly <laughs> um yeah, Kapler's definitely he's definitely deserving of it. Uh, uh-huh. Best team in I mean, best team in baseball. Yeah, and, I mean they almost got it done. Well, and they got eliminated from the playoffs on a trash call. Um, you hate to see a series end on a call like that. It was so bad. It was so bad. Like they they probably could have come back and won that game if they'd just been given one more pitch, and it got taken away from them, and it's it's awful. It is legitimately like upsetting. To, I don't even care about the Giants, and I was upset about it. I do like to argue with people, though. He was already down 0-2. <laughs> he was. Now, yeah, he but was. he even came back. He give him another pitch. There's always that chance. It, but here's he the could. thing. Here's the thing. You always tell a guy when you're in the dugout, he's down 0-2. Hey, you only need one pitch to get a hit. Huh? Needed one more pitch. That's all. Yeah, but you only need one more pitch to strike out. That's true. Yeah, you also only need one pitch to fly out. So it is what it is. But uh, manager of the year for the American League was Kevin Cash. Um, go ahead. I'll get to it. You you lead us off here. I, I don't know what else to – I will say because we didn't touch on it in the free agency because he wasn't a free agent. Signing Franco to a long-term deal is the best decision to raise and made in a long time. Mm-hmm. How long he's a Ray will be in question. Right. Um, I, I lost my, I don't even know if you call it respect, what I thought of Kevin Cash in the World Series last year. I felt like, like Kevin so. Cash tried to, he tried to show that he was smarter than everyone else. And don't get me wrong, what Tampa Bay is doing is working, but it's working well enough to get you to the postseason. 
Well, and it's working from a front office aspect. It's not working on. It's not. It's not working right. because of what he's doing. It's working because of the decisions the front office is making. But well, no, go best, ahead with what you're saying because you're the spot best on. Best example this. with that I can give is you know Billy Beans looked at as this great general manager, this great team guy that runs a team, but he's just ran a team to the playoffs. They've never gotten over the hump. And Kevin Cash is that – I mean, he may be the manager and not the GM, but he's the same way. He's not going to get him to the top. No, he, he overthinks, and like you said, he tries to prove that he's smarter than everybody else by making moves. Um, oh, and So they won 100 games. The Rays won 100 games um, in a division where they should have because Boston fell off uh, during their COVID outbreak. The Yankees were the Yankees, not good. Uh, I feel like the Blue Jays underachieved. This year, they had some bullpen issues that kind of caught up with them. And then Baltimore was Baltimore, unfortunately, for them. Um, the Rays were expect like they should have won that division with the way everybody else played. Kevin Cash didn't do anything to help that team get to where they were. The guy who I thought was deserving and I thought at the beginning of the season was going to be deserving was Scott Service with the Mariners. And I said that was our very first episode of the season. I said that the Mariners are going to overachieve. They're going to miss the playoffs by like maybe a game or two. And Scott Service is going to win manager of the year because nobody saw that coming and ended up missing on the last day of the season. Service did an outstanding job with, I think there were eight or 10 guys who made their major league debut this season. He had Jared Kelnick, who was supposed to win rookie of the year, was like projected to, and he went on an 0 for 38 stretch. But I could see Service at the top of the dugout with him while he's in the hole and head down on deck, just encouraging him, you know, like, like at one point, <laughs> what was it service that he's talking to his bat? He's talking to his bat, like, wake up, you got hits left on you wake up kind of knocking on it, you know, like teaching Kelnick mm-hmm. to, to wake his bat up, you know, it didn't work, but he was there encouraging him, which, you know, right. you could, as a manager, you could be like, I've got bigger fish to fry than a rookie who can't hit. Mm-hmm. But he well, was there. He was, you look Go at ahead. guys, and, and it goes back over to the the National League, which taking nothing from Kapler. It to me, the guy in Seattle probably should have won the award, just because he took a team that was not projected to do very well, and they I mean, maybe win well. seventy games. I think is what a lot and of people had. All Kevin Cash done was do what was projected to happen. Yeah, exactly. And then they get to the playoffs, and they do the same thing that they'd done the year before. Yeah. They made it to the World Series, but making it to the World Series and winning the World Series are two totally different things. It is. And yeah. this year, they well, didn't this, even make it that far. That's what I say. This year, they didn't make it to the World Series. So they actually took a step back from where they were last year. So, yeah, no, I, I didn't think Kevin Cash deserved it. I think that the only reason they give it to him is because he's in a trash market and he's winning. But it's not because of him. It's because of the team that the front office is putting on the field for him. Correct. So. Yeah. All right. Rookie of the year. Uh, speaking of the Rays, got Randy Rose Arena in the American League and Jonathan India in the National League. Um, Rose Arena, I didn't think was going to get it, honestly. Um, because to me, like last year, despite his outstanding postseason, I was like, that's fine. Like you guys, you have guys who have an outstanding postseason every year. Chris Taylor is a postseason all star, but he's average at best in the regular season right. for the Dodgers. You know, and part of that is because he's playing behind guys like Seager, uh, Justin Turner, now Trey Turner, and in the outfield behind Cody Bellinger, who had a down year, and uh, Mookie Betts, right? So there's a lot of big names in front of him, so he's not getting the, the playing time that he deserves. But then in the postseason, when you need a pinch hitter, you need somebody to start the game who can be pinch hit for later, he's getting the playing time that he deserves, and he's having a chance to shine. I thought that Randy Oroz, Randy Oroz Arena was going to be the same way as a rookie who nobody had any scouting information on him at all, mm-hmm. right? But then he comes and he does. He has the year that he did, and he wins rookie of the year. So good on him. That that's one of the things with baseball that's always hard for me to take in is the fact that a guy played in the postseason the year before, done really well, but he comes back in as a rookie the following year. It's always weird to me. Like <laughs> it is weird, well, especially uh, since in like in the NFL, you can sit out your entire rookie season, and that's your rookie year. Mm-hmm. You know, and yeah. then in basketball, if you sit out the first year with a with an injury, you can win rookie of the year the second year, like Ben Simmons exactly. did. And you I've know? never been a fan of that. I just, yeah. I just haven't. To me, I, I was, I would have argued Franco 
a lot of the way just because, yeah, it wasn't a huge sample size, but it was enough to get him paid this year. So, Yeah, I thought he was going to be the guy. I thought it was going to be him. A Rosarita, you know, congratulations. Mm-hmm. But I, I just, eh. <laughs> Not a true rookie. <laughs> no, but I mean. <laughs> well, just... He had the peak of the mountaintop experience the year before, and he thrived. Like, nothing's going to make him nervous. And then in the series like against Boston, didn't he steal home in the series? Yeah, he did. Like, that was, that was awesome. Yeah, but, he, he's mean, lightning, man. He's fun to watch. He's electric. But, yeah, good on him. Congratulations on winning the Rookie of the Year. Jonathan India, you called this one, didn't you? I did. Uh, the National League, there there wasn't a ton of great rookies. Mm-hmm. So it, it was kind of just like he stood out a little bit more than everyone else to me. Yeah. And, uh, unfortunately, he's playing in Cincinnati. But, you well, know. Well, for now, he is. I mean, yeah. I'm sure they'll move on from him in a couple of years and they have to pay him. But, but no, I do remember him standing out though as among the rookies, especially like he's a good player. I'm, I mean, it was he wasn't like there's sometimes you get the rookie of the year and you know they say who won it. You're like, who? I definitely knew who he was. I recognized him. I probably could have picked him out of line out of a lineup. So I, he's got that going for him at the very least because there's a lot of guys in the big leagues who you can't pick out of a lineup because everybody right. kind of. Looks average, but I think that uh, I think next year's crop of rookies is going to be much stronger. Uh, mm-hmm. I think we will see guys like potentially Adley Rutschman will make his next step. It probably it'll depend on how the service time works, on how they can keep control for as long as possible. Yeah. But um, we could see Rutschman. I watched. Uh, what is his name? Torkelson play a couple times this year. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I, I think he's still got some room to grow. Yeah. Uh, a guy in Washington, I think you'll see because they're going to have to bring him up, Cake Valley. Mm. Cake Valley will come out and he could show some strong performances. Uh, there, there'll be a couple guys come out next year, I believe. That's yeah. just on regional to me. I know that Rutschman's going to be, Rutschman's going to be a guy, but to me, I think he'll be more like a, I don't want to say a poor man's Buster Posey. I don't okay. I sit here and tell you that he's going to be as good as Buster Posey because I just don't see that. Mm-hmm. But I think he he has that potential. Well, if he can hit, I mean, if he can be a serviceable defender and he can hit, he'll be successful because Gary Sanchez has lasted this long in the league and the dude can't play a lick of defense by the play. Oh. You know? Very so cool. if he can be serviceable defensively, he'll be fine. And, and if he can hit along with it. But – um but no, you brought up a really good point with service time. Uh, one of the, I guess, the propositions that I saw as being thrown out there is that instead of like X amount of service time, it's that uh, guys can be a free agent after their 29 and a half year season or after they turn 29 and a half mm-hmm. rather than accumulating so much service time because that prevents manipulation of service time because then we very well could be, be seeing Julio Rodriguez on opening day. Mm-hmm. You know, if he has a really strong spring, he could be on the opening day roster for the Mariners. I don't know that he necessarily would be, but he's more likely to be for sure if that's what well, happens. And I think we would have potentially seen Vladdy Jr. a little bit sooner. Oh, for sure. Uh, Vlad Jr. and Chris Bryant are the two poster children for service time manipulation. Oh, yeah. I forgot about 100%. Chris Bryant. Yeah, 100%. He somehow lost his grievance against MLB, which he shouldn't have, but mm-hmm. whatever. Um, Cy Young Awards, uh, we talked a little bit about Robbie Ray earlier for the American League, and National League was Corbin Burns. Um, Robbie Ray, I felt like, was deserving. There were, th- I mean, the three finalists for, for the American League, um, they were all deserving. I mean, let's be honest. I'm not a big Garrett Cole guy, but he sorted things out after the whole uh, <laughs> sticky yeah. stuff, you know? Uh, he, he's... But, yeah, he's overpaid. But he is overpaid, that's for sure. Like, he, and I mean, yeah. just uh, just to let Briggs know, you're probably not going to win a World Series with Garrett Cole because he money tied up, and he's he's been there. He's been to Game Sevens in the World Series. Like he got. Well, I, will, I will say this with Garrett Cole. I will say this with him is that if they get to the World Series and he's on that team, he's going to be hungry because. 
AJ Hinch didn't put him in in Game Seven, and that's part of the reason he's so disgruntled when he left Houston is because he wanted to pitch, he's ready to go, but they didn't put him in when they should have, and that's part of the reason they lost to the Nats. I'm trying to remember how that worked out because I believe didn't they they brought Verlander in? Or did they Verlander brought Verlander in. I think they had him pitch. They left him in too long. Yeah. Yeah, and that's what it was. They, they had him pitch too long. They didn't bring in Cole when they should have. And you know what? I I say it all the time. Like, as a manager, you just have to go with your gut and let a guy hate you for 20 minutes. Because anytime those managers come out to pull a guy like, no, I want one more. It's like, dude, he's going to park this next one over the left field fence if I keep you in here. Because that's what happens every time. That's what happens every single time. I'm trying to remember who went yard too, because it was like back to back shots, yard shots in that World Series. Yeah, I want to say it was uh, Adam Eaton was one of them. I'm and pretty sure. Was it Eaton and Soto? I think it was Eaton and Soto, because Soto was one of them. Yeah, I and think then, I think that's who it was. Then Howie came in and cleaned it up to help win yeah. it all. Yeah, he did. Yep, and then Garrett Cole was all sorts of upset after the game, saying that he was yeah, no he, longer an employee of the Houston Astros. <laughs> he wouldn't even he didn't even wear an Astros hat in the post. He wore a Scott Boris hat. Yeah. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> but but the other guy, Lance Lynn, I felt like he was equally as deserving as Robbie Ray. I mean, I'm gonna be incredibly biased right now and say just give it to Robbie Ray since he's a mariner. Right. But you know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Um, and then the National League, like I said, you had you had Corbin Burns and that was fine. I don't have a problem with that. It the the cool part about this year I felt in that sense, and you know, all of the awards to a point, there was no like big, big name mm-hmm. to me. Like neither Cy Young winner was a huge like Robbie Ray, not taking that from him. He's just not that he's not oh, Max. Sir. No, he's not. He's not. Yeah, he's but, not Garrett that Cole. Is... It's just he's not. It's cool to see guys like that succeed. With the with mm-hmm. Burns too. That that to me is great. Yep, it is. It, good for him, especially with a guy for the Brewers. That's awesome. Right. Um, and then MVPs. Um, National League had Bryce Harper, American League Shohei Otani. Go ahead, National League. Oh uh, well, let's just go ahead and flip it real quick because I'll save that for last. Shohei Otani. Okay. Is. I'll still argue if Vladdy would have won the triple crown, it would have been a it would have been so hard to argue against that because that that it's so hard to accomplish that. What Shohei Otani done is amazing. It's great mm-hmm. for the sport. He's very well deserving. Yeah, and I mean you talk most valuable, the guy who was most valuable for their team out of that group it was definitely Otani. I mean if you're if you're Specifically, giving it to the guy who is absolutely most valuable to his team, Watani well, should win it every year as long as he has a decent year. You know, just because of what he does. But at the same time, it's become the best player on the best team award, or the best player award, not the best player on the best team. Because right. that's my next thing that I want to get to real quick is that of the six finalists, none of them were in the playoffs. Do you, do you have a problem with that at all? I do, and I mean that goes back to the same thing that I talked about. I hold the, I hold. Team awards higher than I do individual awards. To me, mm-hmm. if your team is doing well, then you should be one of those guys on the leading team should be considered for the most valuable player because they their value, they have to be valuable. It, it always mm-hmm. seems like, I mean, Mike Trout's going to be probably the greatest baseball player of the last, of this generation. He, I think he could possibly be, when he retires, one of the top five ever. Yeah, honestly, he's a freak. Like he's outstanding at everything he does. But as long as he's on teams like he's been on, it's it's really hard for me to just be like, yeah. And that's why it's an individual award at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. It's I just don't hold a lot of merit to it. Yeah. They just don't. For me personally, like I don't care if a guy wins a wins two MVPs, whatever. At the end of the day, if he doesn't have a World Series, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, right now on his trajectory, I don't think we'll see Mike Trout win a World Series. I could be wrong. I hope you I know, am. Pitching, I mean, the Angels did get Noah Syndergaard, but one one pitcher a staff does not make. I mean, granted, they've got Otani who pitches really well, but they got a they got bigger issues. They got to sort out that pitching staff. Well, and you got a guy that's coming off a, a major injury. It's not mm-hmm. like he's. I mean, he's pitched two games in the last two seasons. Right. So, and they were both at the end of the season. And, 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 and he only lasted one inning. 
one inning, both outings. Two innings that innings much money. Year. Yeah, that's well, a lot of money for that dude. And like, don't get me wrong, I like Noah Syndergaard, but that's a whole lot of money for a dude who hasn't played baseball in a long time. I'm all about guys getting paid. I, I want to see everybody get paid, but mm-hmm. it's a lot of money to pay for play to pay for a guy that's played two innings in two years. Yep, it is um, definitely. So to me, yeah, Shohei, what he'd done is outstanding. Just to go ahead and roll it over there. And it goes back to the same thing I've said twice previously in this episode. He can have two MVPs. Yeah. Bryce Harper, whatever. Yeah. Like, he don't have a ring. Yeah. He's not going to have a ring. They probably won't. And I could see Sho- uh, Shohei Otani honestly being more aggressive about forcing his way out of Anaheim, sorry, LA, um, than, Bri- than, uh, than Mike Trout. I could see him being more vocal about it because he's already said he's sick of losing. Yeah. When, well, the, when the season ended. likes to lose. Oh, no. Baseball is fun unless you're losing. If you're losing, it's miserable. Let's be honest. And that's, I think that within, and, and here's the thing about it. If we're, if we're going to continue to give the MVP award to guys on bad teams or teams that cannot even make the postseason, I would not be surprised. And this is just me being a Juan Soto advocate. In the next five years, Juan Soto could have two MVPs within five years. If he would have started out as well as what he did in the second half, it would not have been close. He Well, the thing is, though, I mean, Bryce Harper didn't make the all-star team. That's the kind of first half he had. Mm-hmm. And then he went on a tear in the second half. I mean, I know Soto had a better second half, and honestly – uh, we talked about this on Jason's podcast that if Soto went, had won it, I wouldn't have been upset at all. I did. I wouldn't have felt like Harper got robbed, you know. But, well, and it's with with Bryce Harper. It's I think it goes back to this too. Bryce Harper's older. He's not going to have as many chances to win MVPs. I was going to get there next. He, he honestly plays in a a more valuable market than what Soto does. Um, it's, I mean, you can look at the pace in the second half of the season, and Soto just had a tremendous second half. And I, I just think it's one of those, it's another one of those turns that they took, they took part of his team effort, because the big mm-hmm. thing with Harper that was said all year is he became a leader. Right. Okay. And that shows the team aspect of it. But they're using that to also play into the individual award. You, you see what I'm saying? Like, Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah no, I see exactly what you're saying. You're is that basically decision. what they're saying is that he became more valuable as a leader than a player. Because his all, I mean, we've talked about this before. All of his, like all of his statistics are below that of Soto. Soto had a better year statistically. Mm-hmm. That Harper did, but yeah, they're they're bringing in the intangibles, and I absolutely 100 percent agree with you about the about Harper being older and Soto being so young. Is that I do feel like that is part of the problem with the writers voting on this is that they're like, oh, Soto is going to have so many more years to win an MVP. Bryce Harper's window is closing. Let's give him one more, and then Soto can win it next year. What if Soto has a catastrophic injury next year, and either a his career's over, or b he's a shell of himself the rest of his career. And this was the best year of his career, his one shot to win an MVP. Then what? That's the problem I have with that. And it's, and that, that's the guy, though, that I think that he should be. Right now, when you look at who's coming up on potentially getting paid, Soto probably should be that first guy to break that 400 barrier just because he's 23 years old, he has not hit his prime yet. And he's mm-hmm. already arguably the best player in baseball. He's, I, I mean, think, I think he's Tony Gwynn with power. Honestly, yeah, that's mean, how I see him. That to me is a, there, there's not many guys that I would like to hear a guy held in high comparison. Tony Gwynn's one of the greatest to ever do it. And he's never like, he's never brought up when you, when you talk to people <laughs> know, about the greatest players ever, Tony Gwynn is one of the greatest ever with a bat. Mm-hmm. And his yeah. name kind of sweeps under the rug. Yeah. 
Yeah, it does because he wasn't a power hitter. But if if it came down to it in a clutch moment, there are two guys I'd want at the plate: Tony Gwynn and Edgar Martinez. Those are the two I'd want. Yeah. Nobody else. It doesn't have to be a home run. They'll find the gap. Mm-hmm. They're going to get the ball down. I think that is where Soto will eventually be too. Because I mean, he's still growing. He's still uh-huh. learning. But I mean, just plate discipline. And he is like, so he- like so mature beyond his years that I'm scared for pitchers in 10 years. Mm-hmm. I would not want to be pitching to that dude in 10 years. I mean, he might be the one who brings, who makes it trendy again to not strike out because he doesn't. Yeah. Um, I was on a, I saw a, a board. Somebody had said something on like, I think it was like the M- the MLB Facebook when they announced that Harper won the MVP mm-hmm. and somebody was like, Soto should have won it. And this guy's like, all he does is walk. Like, yeah, he's on base. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. It's because he's not striking out. I would rather watch a guy walk 10 times as a strikeout. Yeah, exactly. Exactly right. Soto's doing it. I mean, it's going to be his own way. I'm hoping he does it as a gnat his entire career. If I'm being completely honest, I don't see it happening just because the family just doesn't pay people. They pay, And they pay mm-hmm. the wrong guys. But it's like, yeah, I would love to see him be a nat for his entire career because he's he's already done what you play the game for. He's already won a championship. Mm-hmm. Really, after that, all there is to do is make money. Yeah, and then I'd, I would hate for him, honestly, to put the bag before the title because, um, I mean, we were talking in the – we had to take a little break for technical difficulties. We are talking about me being a Seahawks fan. That's what Russell Wilson has done. He won a, a, a Super Bowl in his second year. They got back this third year, lost on a terrible play call. We won't get too deep into it. But uh, since then, it's been the money, right? Like, mm-hmm. dude, you'll get back to another Super Bowl if you take less money, but he continues to take more every time it comes up. And that's why, as much as oh. I'm sure been a Seahawks fan, you hate to hear that name, and that's why Tom Brady is so great. He was yeah. always willing to take less money. And the reality is, though, they never really invested a ton of money in his offense. You right. Know, no, it's it's that he was that good, but but yeah. No, and like I said, I'd hate for that to be Soto that he's just like I've got mine. Now I'm just going to get the money. I don't think that he's I don't think he's built that way though, honestly. I don't either, but I think once the Nats can get past the Strasburg deal, Oof. um there there's a lot of money to be freed up in the next 3 to 4 years. mm mm-hmm. Mhm. But even if you max out all the way to Soto's, the end of his service time, for one, he's not coming back to you if you max out his service time. No. Um, You've got to try and lock him up now. You should have probably done it last year. But if you try and max out his service time just to get that open window of money, he's not coming back to Washington. Yeah. He's going to go somewhere else, and he's going to compete for a championship every year. Do I believe if you can get him to sign a 10 to a 12 year contract, it may take getting eight years into that deal before you're competing for another championship. But at the end of the day, it'd still be worth it because you've got the Mm -hmm. face and another, you've got another member to put on your Mount Rushmore in Washington. You've got a a guy that when you think of the nationals, you think of, I mean, me personally, I think of Ron Zimmerman, Mm -hmm. of course, Mr. Mr. National. He's going to be the first one you think of. Um, if you want to go way, way back in the day, Walter Johnson. <laughs> yeah. um, you could throw him up there. And when you collaborate Washington with Montreal, you have to throw Vladimir Guerrero up there. Uh-huh. Um, you could even Probably throw Pedro. Pedro. A lot mm-hmm. of great guys. Yeah. But Soto is a guy that can be your George Washington. He, he can, can be. Head. Yeah. Um, definitely just you got to be willing to pay the guy you yep. you see what these you, you look to t's got paid franco got paid after what 76 games yeah <laughs> um well and the mariners paid evan white before he had even played triple a baseball which ended up being a mistake because the dude can't hit mm-hmm. or stay healthy but they took a chance on it they're willing to take the gamble on him because he's a gold glover and they knew that he was a gold glover and that's what they're paying him for. Mm-hmm. They just didn't know that he was going to be a liability offensively. I just think, and you know, a lot of the time I, I get a little bit irritated talking about Bryce Harper just because I thought he was going to be that face of Washington. 
Mm -hmm. Um, but I get that. Well, I mean, he he came up and he was supposed to be the savior of Washington baseball. He was supposed to be the guy who was going to lead them to World Series. But the problem I I always had with that was that, and this is what I say all the time. I mean, I told the my little leaguers this when I was when I was coaching them that if you could win a baseball game by yourself, the Mariners would have won at least th- three World Series in the nineties. Mm-hmm. At least three, because they had the best player in baseball for at least three years, if not five. Right. But here we are. The Mariners still have never been to the World Series. So it'll happen. 2023, going to win it all. I'm calling it. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, let's go ahead and wrap this up. Jonathan, thanks again for joining me on the podcast this week, Baseball Family. Don't forget to jump on the shop. We have our Black Friday deal going on right now. You can hop on there, get 20% off off anything in the shop. That's good until this Friday. Uh, that's going to be um, December 3rd at 11.59 p.m. Eastern time is when that will end. So that's 20% off uh, anything in the shop. No discount code needed. Tonight I'm wearing my uh, KBO Nod hat as well as my Baseball Together sweatshirt. Jonathan is rocking his pink Baseball Together hoodie. It is a fantastic look and he's got his Baseballs for Lovers mug going as well. Very good. Excellent look there. Appreciate it. Uh, but also, baseball family, don't forget to jump in the mailbag. You can do that on baseballtogether.com or you can hit the link down in the description and you can always just send an email with your questions, comments, concerns, and snide remarks as well. And real quick, we're going to plug this while we're at it. Jonathan is going to be joining us, the Baseball Together Network, with, as we mentioned, he's a Nats fan. He's going to be doing the Washington Baseball Together podcast. Very excited about that to bring on his extensive knowledge about the Nats and their farm system. Welcome, Jonathan, officially. Appreciate you. It's going to be a blast. Very excited. And with that, baseball family, we will catch you next week. Mm